Welcome back to this episode of Talking Foreign Affairs with Arnold Carter. In today's show, I am pleased to be joined by a pioneer in the field of gender equality and foreign policy. A Swedish foreign minister, she broke boundaries by making her country the first in the world to formally launch a feminist foreign policy. We are lucky to be joined by none other than Margaret Wallström. May I also add, this recording is taking place in the historic times of Sweden when they have just appointed their first female prime minister in the history of the country. Margaret Wallström was elected as a member of Swedish parliament in 1979. She went on to serve as minister in various portfolios before returning to European politics in 1999, where she served successive terms as European commissioner. In 2007, she became chair of the Ministerial Initiative on the Council of Women for World Leaders. In 2010, Ban Ki-moon, then Secretary General of the UN, appointed her first special representative on sexual violence in conflict. She was Sweden's Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister from 2014 to 2019. During her time in office, she developed a worldwide reputation as a leading advocate of gender equality and human rights. The theme of the discussion will be on gender equality and foreign policy, as well as going over highlights of Margaret Wallström's time in office. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. So the first question is, this, uh, the feminist foreign policy, uh, just start with us how you came up with this idea and the inspiration behind it. Well, um, first of all, as you just mentioned, for a couple of years, a little more than two years, I was the first special representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations to work on the issue of conflict-related sexual violence. And I must say that that experience gave me um, both a heavier heart, uh, I must say, but but also maybe paradoxically more hope for the future because I could see the deep imprint that sexual violence used as a weapon or a strategy in war and conflicts, uh, uh, what that did to a person, a family, a society, a, a country. Uh, and also that when women were not part of any peace process, um, there cannot be sustainable peace. And I, I took that with me and that particular experience with me uh, when I was appointed um, new foreign minister of, of Sweden in 2014. And I decided to, um, it was kind of sticking my neck out, uh, calling it a feminist foreign policy. And what I meant was, of course, that more women uh, means more peace. It is as simple as that. And how can you not make that a pillar in your foreign policy in, in these days? So to me, it was important. But it was also important to, as soon as possible, define it and, and um, also provide sort of the parameters by which we asked our uh, diplomats around the world to work on this, to implement it. And to me, it was also a very practical policy, not only like a motto, but, but really practical policy uh, changing, changing the world. So from there came the, the three R's, you know, that I, I um, uh, presented uh, to lead our, our work and steer our work. So the, the three R's being rights, representation and resources meaning that we should always ask, do women and girls enjoy the same sort of legal and human rights as, as boys and men? Um, do they have the right to go to school? Do they, have, do they have the right to open a bank account, to start a business, to, to be heard? And that leads into the second R about representation. Are they there around the table where important decisions are being made? Are they in parliaments and governments, in, in boards, uh, et cetera? Do they have that kind of influence in decision making? And thirdly, resources. What about gender budgeting? Are we sure that uh, the budgets also devote resources to meet the needs of, of women and girls? So you highlight, Sorry, a long, a long answer to your short question. Oh, no, you highlight, I mean, you've gone over some of the other questions as well I've been to ask, but um, 
some uh, you did mention quite correctly that in order for there to be progress in regards to peace and security, you need to have women at the table. And the feminist foreign policy was actually based on the notion that sustainable peace, security, and development um, can't be achieved without world's and half without half the world's population, uh, which is a very logical explanation, one would think. But however, in this day and age, you would think that most foreign policies around the world would not discriminate against women. However, clearly there are, which kind of motivated you to start with feminist foreign policy. Just explain what your frustration was like in having to deal with this reality. Well, just look around today in, in the news, the reports that come from um, Myanmar, from Yemen, from Afghanistan, uh, from around the world, and you will see that women are are very much um, out of, of that um, uh, discussion or those negotiations. They are not visible around the the negotiating tables or in delegations that that we see from from and in those uh, countries and we see that very often since we are living in in a world where democracy is is losing and we have more of authoritarian um rule uh, in in so many place, places um the first thing that these autocrats often do is to attack the rights of of uh, girls and women uh, to control them. And uh, we, of course, have seen it with the Taliban in, in Afghanistan just uh, recently. But they have, and women have ended up on the front lines of modern war and conflict, uh, not as fighters, but as victims of, of violence. So you need to make sure that, that women are, are involved and, and uh, take part of, of every step in, in uh, peace processes as, as well. So, so this was uh, uh, very important to us and also to be credible in that we made sure that um, our own, we appointed um, our own diplomats, uh, also women appointed as, as ambassadors around the world, for example. And we also um, started a, a network of uh, women mediators and negotiators because I often heard the argument, well, there are no women that can, you know, negotiate or, or, or be part of, um, of these processes, mediate. So, um, we have, uh, we started such a network and there are now Nordic networks. There are, uh, international networks of women mediators. Uh, so, so that has been followed up. And I think today you cannot use that, uh, that argument. And they are deployed to different uh, conflict and post-conflict uh, situations around the world. So you mentioned quite descriptively how you use the foreign service, the diplomatic service quite effectively through these networks, through, through your embassies overseas, which seem to have been working. However, when you first started, as many people would notice, there would be challenges, I guess, with anything you try for the first time. So with some of the challenges you initially faced when trying to implement these foreign policies, so what were the main challenges and how did you overcome them? Well, I, I think it's uh, maybe an understatement to say that also in the diplomatic corps, when I first announced that we would pursue a feminist foreign policy, that there was hesitation and uh, a rather loud gasp from from uh, many of, of the diplomats. So they were, of course, uh, uh, thinking, what, what on earth is, is, will this mean for us? And to use the, the concept or the word feminist, of course, it first of all gave us a chance to define what does that mean? What is being a, a feminist uh, uh, t today? And um, it is as simple and as complicated as... Uh, recognizing that both women and men should enjoy the same rights, obligations, and opportunities. That's how it is defined also if you look it up. And uh, and and then uh, after that, it was necessary to make sure that we, that we could use this um, uh, more detailed description of and the parameters that I just mentioned, the three R's. And, and it starts with, with another R, and that is, of course, a reality check. In this country, um, how many um, how many child marriages are there? 
or uh, do women really enjoy the same sort of legal rights and human rights in in this particular country? And if you start to look at it from that point of view, as as many ambassadors also told me, we started to to look at who who are the people we invite to come to to us or that we listen to. Should we make it more a better gender balance also in in that in the different events that we have in the in the way we we approach those things? So and you have to set up a structure also at home at the foreign ministry. So there has to be training. There has to be uh, a yearly action plan. We have done reporting to the parliament. We have to make sure that it is result oriented. That we also can measure success or the lack thereof. Well, that's how you mentioned it. That was a, it was a two-step process. Obviously, there were the challenges internationally, but first starting at home, looking at your domestic diplom- um, the domestic government and the diplomatic corps, trying to ensure everything internally was sound before going um, moving this internationally. However, going back to the earlier point, like it's fair to say your experience as special representative for the UN uh, Secretary General would have helped in your experience as foreign minister. Kind of looking at your earlier years, say 2014 onwards, when the feminist foreign policy was just starting, give us some examples how your on the ground experience in those war zones or those development areas as special representative, that knowledge you, you took from certain events helped you in those initial years as foreign minister. First of all, I should add that we also started by inviting uh, our uh, representations and and uh, embassies and and our staff, our diplomatic staff, to to give us input, to provide us with the questions they had and and the ideas. And I must say that very cl- quickly, the hesitation that we felt from the beginning turned into a lot of enthusiasm. And I must say that this has become one of the one of the, the most successful things that that we've done. And we now. I think we are by now eight countries that uh, uh, actually pronounce that we uh, and work with uh, uh, a feminist foreign policy in one way or the other. So other countries have followed and they realize that that we do have a point. It's not only the right thing to do, but it, it's it's actually the smart thing to do. And then we also um, we ran a campaign to to win a, a non permanent seat on the. Security Council, the UN Security Council. And this was another chance for us to show what does this mean uh, in that position? What can we make out of that uh, presence uh, um, and participation in, in the Security Council uh, decisions? Um, and we really made a difference, I have to say, because we made sure that all the Security Council resolutions, all the decisions have to mention have to include uh, women and the role of women. We made sure that we invited women as briefers to the Security Council. I made sure that uh, our ambassador in the Security Council always would raise his hand and, and ask, where are the women? Are they there as peacekeepers? Are they there as police in the in the, the different UN missions around the world? So I think consistently we we made sure that this was on the agenda of the Security Council and that it will stay there because you, you have to listen to women. So that was my experience from traveling to the DRC or Liberia or all the, the, or Bosnia Herzegovina. You have to include women. You have to make sure that they are part of, of the peace process, like in, in Colombia. At first, there were no women in in Cuba. And of course, uh, the Colombian women uh, had experienced uh, being victims of of the the conflict and and, and all the atrocities uh, committed. And they also wanted to have a say. They wanted their voices to be heard. So I like how you mentioned how you strategize and thought of a long-term strategy. And you were foreign minister from 2014 to 2019. Like anything in diplomacy or government, governments change, parties change. However, to make a policy continue, there needs to be some sort of sustainability. How did you ensure and plan ahead to ensure this wasn't just going to be a one-term thing 
or to, to the Valencia, this was something that we continued by future Swedish farmers to come. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question and, and a relevant and valid uh, one. Uh, you have to make sure that there is a, a structure, that you build a structure and a system that, that will remain and that will work long term. So you have to make sure that there is training for, for everybody. You have to ensure that there are uh, decisions on, for example, these action plans. They were very important. They were sort of re- yearly and also that you have a reporting uh, back to the ministry so that you can actually explain um, how to, to measure s- success. And then um, you have to make sure that you are accountable. You have to set your own sort of targets and, and explain and then um, also report to media and to, to, to ensure parliamentary both transparency and, and inclusion and accountability in the end. So, so this is what you do when you, when you present such a new idea. You also uh, create accountability because they will follow up. They will ask, so what happened and, and how do you measure that? So that structure has to be put in place. And I, the next question I'm going to say is from the perspective of an Australian way. It's a two-party system. We have one party in power, three years past, and another party in power. But just to sort of educate my Australian audience to understand the Swedish political system, given how it's um, very much run through coalitions, can you just explain to us briefly how this coalition system has impact when a foreign policy is written or a diplomatic service? If there's a change, how do you... Is it that it requires more consultation within the different parties and, and another change of? How does this um, coalition system impact foreign policy formula? Well, of course, um, it means that, for example, a budget, you have to negotiate with, with the other parties and you have to, to make it pass uh, through um, parliamentary scrutiny and decisions. But uh, foreign policy normally is not sort of something that you have to, this is the, um, the competence of the, um, of the government. And, uh, it means also that the, the government can, can decide on, on foreign policy. But we do have regular consultation and information to also to the opposition and, and to the parliament. And I think in, in everything we do, we try to, to get as much consensus as possible around uh, the the big lines in in foreign policy and luckily we have we've had that and and I think we've had it on the basic elements also of foreign policy although the opposition um, they uh, um, they had some arguments against uh, choosing the that that motto or that uh, way of formulating it just to call it a feminist foreign policy but they they have not. Um, um, they have not uh, opposed sort of the, the the content in the in the end. They understand that this is uh, something that uh, uh, will lead to, as I said, more more women means more peace in the end. Thanks. That it was nice to get an insight into the Swedish political system. Moving back to the foreign policy and the diplomacy. Now, Sweden is well known for its soft power. In the latest soft power rank, international soft power rankings, they were rated fourth in the world. So when you first launched the feminist foreign policy in 2014, did you envisage that other countries would be inspired to launch similar programs? And I believe you named some countries early on, Canada, France, Mexico. Well, uh, we did not sort of count on that. We we were hoping that we would inspire we would inspire others and and hopefully be able to to lead. Um, uh, something and uh, I, I think we we can see, I can see now that there is a huge interest and I, I could fill my whole days with uh, talk, <laughs> talking about this and writing about it and, and solving in the, in a, a global debate about this issue. So we are pleased that this has been um, this has been pursued by by others as as well. Um, so. Um, I just think it's really it's smart smart power rather than soft power. But I do believe that if you you know the the saying the Latin saying of of if you want 
peace, you have to prepare for war. I think if you want peace, you have to prepare for peace. I think you have to invest in and and put money into diplomacy and and political contacts and dialogue. That is always the first front line or should be the first front line. And if you want that, you have to make sure also that you invest in, in that. You mentioned about dialogue and diplomacy and something very important to Sweden and regionalism is this concept of Nordic cooperation. Um, to my listeners, you were also the Minister for Nordic Cooperation. But can you first explain to us the importance of region, regionalism and Nordic cooperation with Sweden, but also how that cooperation with our Nordic countries, countries that are actually well known for their progressiveness and gender equality, how did that cooperation actually help with the promotion of the feminist foreign policy? I think that um, I, I'm very, I feel very proud of the Nordic uh, cooperation. And actually, um, I contributed to a book that just been released in, in Australia called The Nordic Edge. And it explains why we are um, uh, a bit unique in, in the way we have uh, um, organized our cooperation between the Nordic countries. It has been made easier of course, by the fact that we have very much the same um, sort of traditions and, and we can understand uh, languages and we can, um, it's, it's easy, short distance between, between our countries. Um, uh, but um, I think you also have to, to build it and maintain it uh, consciously and and this is what we've done. We have a, a council, a Nordic council. We meet uh, also, for example, the foreign ministers uh, regularly. We, we talk about uh, different situations. It has been put to a test with uh, COVID, for sure, uh, because uh, suddenly borders were closed and there were controls, uh, border controls, and also with migration. We've, we've been put to, it has been put to a test, but I think if it's there, if the structures are there, it's easy to overcome also when there are challenges or, or problems. Um, and um, it opens up the labor market. It opens up to share uh, experiences in everything from how you legislate to um, uh, culture. And I, I think it just enriches our political life and makes uh, everyday life easier for for many of our, our citizens. And I, and I use that mode of cooperation to promote the feminist foreign policy. So when you first launched in 2014, did that regionalism, that, that the group, the fact you had all those countries behind you, did that help promote the message overseas? Well, I think basically we have very much in common when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to uh, um, to our sort of systems of, of uh, foreign aid. We, um, and also when it comes to gender equality, um, our legislation and our very much our uh, attitudes and the level of awareness of, the, of these things is, is similar. Um, so I, I think, um, it, it was, uh, it was easy and it was well received, even though, uh, I think that uh, maybe on the conservative, more conservative parties, they hesitate to use the, to use the, what they think is a rather, um, what should I call it, um, a radical notion of, of feminist, of feminist foreign policy. Uh, but we, uh, we have, this, this is an easy subject to discuss between the Nordic countries. What other main barriers would you say exist globally in terms of women's participation in political processes? I I think that um, we uh, globally we can say that we have a lot of the legal norms and frameworks established. We have. Uh, globally, UN resolutions, we have conventions, we have laws in most countries um, that declare equal rights for, for men and women um, that is based on the respect for, 
for the Convention on, on Human Rights, but the implementation is still lagging behind. You know, there there is women are still not naturally a part of peace processes around the world. They are not there to negotiate peace in in Libya or in in Yemen or um, in and of course we we see such a huge backlash for women and girls in in Afghanistan. So there is so much more to do. And we have to work together, uh, also including men, to change this around. Because it would be good for everybody if if we see more of, of gender equality uh, also uh, in the field of, of foreign policy. And I think it is absolutely the... Um, the most reasonable and the smartest thing to do to make sure that that women uh, enjoy the same rights, representation, and resources as men. Yeah, heading into our last question, and you touched about this briefly early on in the interview, but if you could go into a bit more detail. Looking back now, how do you view the success of the feminist foreign policy, not just in terms of the execution by your foreign ministry, what else could have changed the world overseas? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, in order to be relevant, in order to be effective, you also have to be able to reform and develop a policy like this one. And I believe that what we have to look at now is really inclusion. How do we make sure that it is intersectional, that it is seen as embracing and including everybody and all all women, um, and uh, to do that in a very sort of conscious uh, way from now on. And I think we have to be even even tougher when it comes to the the kind of democratic backlash that that we see. We have to be aware aware because to me this is also part of democracy. This is. Uh, an argument for for democracy that women are are included, and how can we speak about uh, democracies if if women are consistently being um, closed out? Um, so um, you, you, we just have to make sure that the, the structures remain there, but we also have to develop the, those different areas. Margaret, thank you so much for such an interesting conversation. Thank you for telling us all about these insightful stories and your impressions on gender equality and foreign policy. Uh, you've had an extraordinary career and been a pioneer. My listeners would agree that they were privileged to listen to your contribution. So thank you so much. No, thank you very much. And those were uh, very clever questions. So I happily, uh, I'm, I have happily answered to, to all of them. And I hope that you will continue the discussion and uh, also provide us with more ideas. This goes both ways. So 